welcome back. Is there anyone up the back there looking for a seat and they can't find one? Put your hand up if you've got a spare seat next to you. Oh, look at that. They I need think a they're friend. just lurking. I don't think Come on, everyone. There Give them go. a friend. Okay. Uh, so we've seen on the on the screens just before there was a time lapse set up of everything that's happened sort of uh, yesterday. So a big thanks to Diane Lawson for putting that together. If you put your hands together, where are you, Diane? Where are you, Diane? Up the back. She's hiding. <laughs> there she is up the back. Everybody, welcome to day two of what's going to be another amazing day. There's a couple of you that have joined us for the first time today. So welcome to you. And if you don't know us, I'm April and this is Jackie. And we're going to be your host for today. And let's hope that it's another inspired, filled morning. And you know what? It's pretty early. I've been up since the crack of dawn. And I reckon we need a little bit of energising to happen. Oh, yes. I'm not going to tell you a joke, but I am going to bring out my furry friends over here. Captain Kawhi and Patty, a little bit of music if we could please, Mr. Music Man. And how about we give these guys a bit of a clap? Come on. Cue the music. That's very low key music. We needed a little bit of pumping action. You know what? There's some good wiggling. Let's give them a bit of clapping music. mascots and these are another engagement tool so remember these are your resources you can hire them for free from your regional offices make sure you guys make the most of these use creativity to engage and I reckon that this just shows the testament who feels like we've joined forces this weekend who feels like we've got something out of each other yeah you two should give each other a high five yeah give each other a high five oh. Oh I think we should say goodbye now. <laughs> say thank you to CK and Patty. Five minutes, we've designated a whole bit of time for a Q&A. Get off your scallywags, you're distracting everyone. Go on. So we've got our Q&A this morning. We've got a fabulous panel that's joining us up the front. Oh my gosh, we're just going to wait a moment. Anyone can get in that suit. <laughs> Anyone. It's true, anybody can do it. So we're gonna have a wonderful panel this morning. Yeah, so from uh, to here to field your questions from the CFA, so I'll get them to come up uh, as we sort of call them out. Uh, we've got the Chief from CFA here today. Please welcome Chief Officer Ewan Ferguson. Uh, we have also have Executive, Executive Manager of Community Capability, Andrew Andreo. Manager of Program Design and Community, De Community Development, Gwyn Brennan. Well, Gwyn makes her way up the front. We've also got a panel from the SES, so please welcome the CEO of the SES, Stephen Griffin. <laughs> we 
We'd also like to welcome the Director of Emergency Management Planning and Communications, Ben McFadgen. And we'd also welcome the Manager of Emergency Management Planning, Kate White. All right, so clearly we won't be able to get to all 500 of you in the next 55 minutes. Uh, there is a live SMS board being set up behind us, <coughs> behind you, uh, in front of you. Uh, and so you can keep your text messages very short and relevant. If they go on over 160 characters, apparently the machine doesn't like it. Computer says no. Um, so try and uh, keep it relevant as well. So there's going to be a couple of roaming microphones. So if you've got a question, make sure you pick up your pick up your hand and grab a roaming microphone person, which is Gabby standing at the back and um, and Tracy over here. Make sure your text messages and questions are relevant. We're here to get answers, not to vent. So we can vent at another occasion. This is a good time to get answers that are relevant to community safety. All right, so what do you reckon? Um, you and or Stephen, do you have anything you'd like to say first before we kick off? <laughs> you'll have to share your microphone. Testing, testing. <laughs> Uh, look, I might just stand up because I can't. I've got the lectern in the way over here, just so that uh, I can be seen. But uh, I guess a couple of uh, starting up comments. Um, the first is, it is absolutely fantastic to have SES as uh, our partners in uh, what started off as a CFA community engagement forum. I think five years ago, I remember tracking over to Masset an early one morning, uh, and to see this evolve as a joint agency uh, activity, I think uh, speaks volumes speaks volumes about where the sector is going, but it also speaks volumes for this uh, craft of uh, community engagement and uh, community safety within our communities. Uh, I, I'd like to, at the outset, just thank all of you uh, and, and your brigades and units for what you do. Uh, the work you do has very real outcomes. Uh, we measure and we see reported uh, people who lose their lives in fires and other emergencies, we see damaged bills. But what we don't see, probably what we don't report uh, properly enough, is a reduction in these incidents as a result of your good work. So I was just saying to a group this morning uh, that often when I'm driving around I'll be listening to the CFA radio and Vic Fire will come on, there'll be a brigade turned out to maybe a um, kitchen fire and a lot of the time, a lot of the time, the caller will say, uh, and we're assembled at the letterbox. Um, and that's a real credit, because that's saying that community safety works. On the 9th of February 2014, uh, a significant anniversary of Black Saturday, it was a really, really nasty day. I think we had um, some areas of the state which were in catastrophic fire danger. Uh, and I just want to highlight another real example of how this function is working. There was a fire uh, in the Warrandyte, South Warrandyte area. Uh, it, I think it burnt three houses um, and, and there was another house seriously damaged under some of the most severe conditions that we'd had since Black Saturday. Uh, and, and the fire was put out. Uh, but when I, when I sort of had the review of, of that particular fire, it was certainly a success on the day because we had fire and emergency services working together. We had MFB, uh, they would have been deputy at the time, and CFA working together. We had integrated aircraft response, so we'd learned a whole of those things from, from Black Saturday. But the really, really significant thing was that the community reacted in the right way. The community were there defending their house in the right way. The community had learned a whole lot of lessons um, from where they had been uh, in the previous uh, four or five years. And in that same community, we've seen the community has actually taken control of the bushfire messaging from CFA. Um, and there was a, a YouTube video that showed the community, and it was the voice of the community who was inspiring other members of the community to, to be fire safe. And I just think that was just such a great example of, under a severe day, the community engagement, the community uh, safety, the fire prevention working, and all the agencies working together. So I, I just think, how good is that? I, I'm, I'm going to 
stop at a moment, but I just also want to make a comment that uh, for CFA, and I know within the sector, uh, we are going down the path of increasing the inclusiveness and the diversity of our organisations. And it's a pleasure, as I look out uh, in front of us now, to see the number of uh, women and men who are on this journey. And the little steering group from CFA who I had breakfast with this morning, it wasn't constructed this way, but half of them were men and half of them were women. And we need to continue to go down the path of increasing the diversity of SES and CFA and all of the emergency services. Increasing the diversity means that we will be a better reflection of the community. We will be able to engage more effectively and with greater confidence with the community and they will have greater confidence in us. And I know one of the discussions around the table is how do we, uh, how do we get into some of these communities, particularly communities who are refugees, who perceive emergency services and people who wear uniforms and drive you know, flash cars and so on, they perceive us in a different way. So I challenge you when you go back to your brigades and your communities to continue to seek out new members, to continue to value the diversity and gender in race, sexuality, skin colour, religion. Uh, it might be quite challenging to our current memberships, but it's through that diversity that we will become stronger, better and more connected with the community. You do a great job. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ewan. I'm uh, only new to emergency uh, services, so I've been with the uh, organisation for just over 12 months. But uh, where I was last night, we were celebrating our 40th anniversary of the SES unit in Rochester. You start to get a bit of a feel for the history and the culture of emergency organisations, but also volunteerism. And when I drove over this morning and seeing the numbers of people and obviously the vehicles that get you here, um, it, it, you, can't be, you can't be more than proud of the volunteerism and the strength and unity that's in this room. Coming into it new, I saw the Emergency Management Victoria trying to drive at, at our level and Ewan's level and my level and Chief Officer level and right across the organisation that unity and try to tap into what is a great resource that we have across Victoria. But when you see it practically in the room here and the work that's being done, that's where the strength will be for the future. Last night we were talking about wonder what the future brings for the SES in that particular case, but imagine what it's going to be like in the next five to ten years, where you can see what it's going to be like. It's going to be actually harnessing the great skill, the talent, right across emergency services and not that silo effect which historically has been the way we've been brought up. We've done those particular things in our silos. But imagine the energy and the passion, that if you put that energy together, what you can achieve. So this weekend, I want to thank very much the CFA and, and the SES and the, and the staff and the volunteers that have been involved in organising this. You can see the future is very bright um, and you can see that if we work together, the community of Victoria is in safe hands. So. I commend you for your time, your effort, and I think this weekend's obviously been something that we can grow into the future. Thank you very much. Right, we're going to start. So start your text messages. Start your hands raised if, um, if you've got something that you're burning to start a question with. Over here, start her off. If you'd like to direct the question to a certain panellist, please do, otherwise just ask and um, I'm sure someone will pick it up. Okay, um, yeah, this is a question for the SES team here. Yesterday, one of the breakout sessions, we heard of the success of the cadet program in New South Wales. Can you see a situation in Victoria where uh, the cadet program is embraced more strongly and driven harder by the organisation? <laughs> uh, I think I can have a go at that one. Um, I, uh, I went to a meeting up in New South Wales a few months ago where they sort of debriefed us on the, on, the, on the program up there. And what I found quite interesting was that um, in New South Wales, the cadet program wasn't so much about getting um, kids into, into a volunteer role and part of the SES. It was more about um, 
sort of educating them about how to prepare for an emergency, what to do when one hits, and, and it's sort of more in that readiness space, which, and that's quite a different approach to, to a cadetship. And the one thing that they sort of were saying, okay, well, that was phase one, we're going to start moving into phase two, we're going to look at, at that recruitment side. And it did make me wonder, well, is that something that we can sort of sort of move into? I think at the moment, um, and, and Steve can, I guess, verify this, we want to get, get our organisation positioned for, for the future at the moment, and, and, and then we can look at it sort of later on, but at the moment we're sort of more focusing on our current um, cadre of, uh, of volunteers and ensuring that we've got the people in place um, you know, to, to work in readiness and in response. So, it's certainly something that's on the, on the cards, but not immediately. Would you agree with that, Steve? Yeah, I think that yeah, we're very open to, we're doing a service review, as you know, so I think that we're open to all suggestions, and I think it's a mate, you, you tap into the, suggest, the, the suggestion that are made around cadets, but it's also around making sure that it actually works for our units or our volunteers, because I found as if you start to impose those things across the organisation, it doesn't work in every case. We're, we're finding that our, our service has to be tailored for, obviously, certain communities, um, it's not one size fits all, which is coming out more and more. And I'm, I'm sure that on that style of uh, cadet um, thought, that it will be tailored and work in certain communities and others might take it up. But we're certainly open to the suggestion and then we've just got to make sure that it, uh, as Ben saying, doesn't divert us from actually some of the immediate things that we need to do. But the question is, I suppose, how do we tap into new, new people, youth, um, and, and diverse communities across, uh, across Victoria to be part of our uh, SES. Um, just in adding to that, there was a great, uh, Sarah Ford from the Nella SES unit presented a really great pilot of a project that she's been doing around kids. So it's something very much that we'll be taking back on and getting a briefing from Sarah on that. And that might be the way to how do we actually engage children and uh, get their interest in actually joining as a volunteer in the future. I've got a question down the back there. Our ECS unit has got a cadet program through the local school and we often get one or two cadets out of the end of the VCE year 12 join the unit. I think that's obviously an example where certain communities and um, it'll work quite well and people drive those sorts of things and we need to support that um, and others will be going into other spaces, so uh, I commend you for the great work that you're doing there. Uh, g'day, uh, I'm Tony Ray from Conwack. Sorry about bending your ear last night, Ewan. Um, but we still want to try. Um, <laughs> my question is, is with integration, on the fire ground there's many tasks that uh, the SES would be able to undertake. Uh, drafting, that sort of thing, truck filling. Um, is there going to be a recommendation come out of training requirements for that to take place? And what recognition would have to be put on to maybe the SES uniform, a CFA logo, to say that they've done min skills and can assist on the fire ground? Um, and is there going to be some sort of formal package come out of how we can, at brigade level, integrate with SES at in my case, I've got Inverloch and one Thaggy, and do uh, training together and develop what uh, assistance they can be actually on the fire ground. Um, thanks, Tony. And it was Conrad for a new heavy tanker. <laughs> um, look, look I, I guess higher level guidance. You know, and you know, we've got senior people from the organisations here. I know Craig was here yesterday, John Haynes was here yesterday, Steve Warrington's going to be here later on today. Um, and our guidance to you is through the words, we work as one. So those are some words that uh, came up uh, a couple of years ago. Hello, what's happening here? <laughs> Sorry, Tony, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to answer your question. Um, I'll, I'll just ignore that for a moment. Um, what I do want to reinforce is that 
the majority of the good things that have occurred, the, the step changes in organisations like SES and CFA have arisen because they're done at the local level first. So my, my you know, with that high level guidance, we work as one, is your licence, if you're in the SES unit and you think you can help CFA or you're in CFA and you can think that SES can be of some assistance, or it might even be CFA helping Life Saving Victoria or Red Cross. Um, the example that we're trying to demonstrate with the agencies being on the stage together today, as you see the agencies on the stage together when there are emergencies and, and all those meetings beforehand, uh, that it's okay to work together and to go beyond the traditional role. Because whilst we have our agency mission statements, actually we're here for two things. We're here to serve the community and we're here to do uh, good things when bad things happen to the community. So, so there's the mission statement and I would say if you think there are a couple of SES units that Comac Brigade or your group of brigades can convene a discussion and come up with an arrangement then that's great. Now the second part of the question is are we going to provide some guidance in how we do that? Um, can I take that on board? Yeah, we can provide some principles and, and um, uh, maybe we need to have a meeting with Stephen and, and his executive team to see how we might be able to define uh, how CFA, CFA units, CFA brigades and SES units work more closely together. But it's great that you recognise the need to do it and I would say don't feel constrained, just go out and do it and then tell us how successful it is and bring it back to a forum like this, Tony. Heavy tanker. Heavy. Can't wait. <laughs> In the middle. Uh, this is a question for you, and I think um, uh, Ian Shelton, uh, Eagle Hawk Brigade, and Eagle Hawk, of course, is on the um, uh, northern fringe of Bendigo, and it's got, a, um, I guess, a, an at-risk uh, uh, community uh, on the urban uh, forest interface. So, how important do you see the the? It's a question about PAVs, the um, the property advice visit services or tools for engaging at risk residents in those rural urban interfaces, and what can we do to reassure our brigades that uh, the knowledge base of our volunteers will be good enough for the task? Uh, a great question and, uh, and I guess when we talk about the protection of the community there are a range of things we do and I know in that Eagle Hawk area one of the key partners there uh, for your bushfire risk is, uh, is DELP uh, and Parks Victoria and I know that uh, because I have regular discussions and, and see the work on the ground, planned burning is a really important part of, of the response to bushfire there uh, and if I can sort of launch that off, in the last two years uh, there has been um, a commitment by, uh, by the government of the day to fund the development of greater understanding about planned burning and, and involvement burning. So, so that's, that's, I suppose, one thing. In, rega in, in regards to the uh, property advice uh, service, um, we've probably come through a, a bit of a, um, you know, we've had some experiences and we, we had that uh, initially where we had, you know, a largely paid staff would go along, people would ring up and it was a very, very expensive service and, and is everyone, um, I know I'm going to get a, a question about budget later on, uh, but I, I just want to reinforce that as an example where we were very conscious of how much that paid service was costing. But we had to balance that against the fact that in a lot of cases the uh, property advice visiting service was able to target the, the, the highest risk properties. So um, you know, part of the evolution of this um, um, program in CFA has been to say, well, actually our volunteers are uh, in many cases just as well equipped and just as experienced and we can tr give them that bridging training so that volunteers can knock on the doors. And, and it's a, you know, we're very fortunate. We're one of few organisations that can develop that relationship with our community by knocking on their door. 
So I guess the first thing I want to say here is that, or the second thing I want to say is that um, knocking on doors, the, the property visiting and advice service is absolutely a great program. What we need to do is make sure that it is uh, resourced not only effectively but it's sufficiently resourced. And we think the best way of doing that is, is making sure that volunteers, local people, are trained to do it. Now there'll be some brigades who will say, but we don't have members who can do that work. My response to that is go out and recruit them because they are in the community. And I know, as I look around the, the room here, there are people who, um, whose primary role is around community engagement, community education, not in responding. I think that's one of the really important messages we need to send about CFA is we're not just about red trucks and responding. We do that when we've had an organisational failure and an incident. We actually see it as being really important to prevent and prepare. But that critical role with the community, knocking on the door, walking into someone else's property or walking around that property, providing them with the advice, is just one of the linchpins. Now, with the, the, the other comment I'd make is that um, through the, um, uh, uh, help me Andrew, the risk mapping that we do, the hazard mapping process, we now have uh, mapped on uh, townships all around uh, Victoria um, where our highest risk properties are. So what we're saying in terms of value for money is rather than just door knocking the whole of Eagle Hawk, let's look at what our risk mapping is doing and let's target our efforts in those areas which are first of all at greatest risk, but secondly most vulnerable. So our decision making on where we target um, our activities will be based on risk uh, and it will be based on vulnerability. I hope that somehow answers your question. Thank you. Gwyn Brennan. Um, I just wanted to add something. Yesterday I uh, ran a little session on um, a disaster and disadvantage and the recent dropping off the edge report from the Jesuit Social Services, um, Eagle Hawks listed as one of the most disadvantaged communities in the state. And so we're also looking at the situation where people that um, have an interaction with us are unable to do um, the level, the preparedness or the maintenance of their properties and things like that that, that are required to um, reduce their risk. And we're looking at the partnering with other community sector organisations, caregivers and those about how they can support those people to plan to leave effectively and efficiently on high risk days and so on. Because we, we may come across people through our PAVS program that we are concerned about and we need to have some sort of referral networks in place to ensure that they get some follow-up support or uh, with their consent of course and being conscious of privacy issues but uh, so this whole area of working with uh, people who are experiencing disadvantage um, and may have special needs or a whole range of things is another area that we're tackling at the moment. And that's just going to sort of complement those mainstream programs. Thank you. And, and I'm just going to jump in here because um, there's a fellow called Chris Eccles who's the uh, Secretary of the Department of Premier Cabinet. And one of Chris's uh, broader themes is about co-production. So uh, an example of co-production is uh, rubbish removal. So. Uh, it used to be that you'd put everything into a rubbish bin and put it out on the nature strip and, or the service would come along and collect it. Now what happens under this co-production theme, we as householders separate out our vegetable waste from our recyclables from our real rubbish. So that's an example where we're doing that, we're not paid to do it, but it's in our interest to do it. And then it, it's a much more efficient way of dealing with rubbish. That's an example of co-production. What Wynne has just highlighted, and we're seeing today with co-production between SES and CFA, but when we go into a property and we notice something wrong, we need to be connected up with the council welfare people, with the Department of Health and Human Services, and with all those other agencies, so that increasingly our role in the community is one not only of providing advice, if, if it's SES, about maybe flood and, and storm, or CFA, it might be around fire. But it might be also saying, look, we'll provide some advice, but we've noticed something else is wrong. And we want to put you in contact with someone else 
who can help you because, as Gwyn said, a lot of the time those vulnerable people aren't empowered to ask for help themselves. So again, we need to think of our role, our emerging role, in developing the capability in the community as, as being connecting up all these co you know, organisations who, who share this responsibility in our community. Thank you. So we're just going to some of our text questions now. They're flying in uh, thick and fast. I think, Andrew, you've uh, got a couple you've been keeping note of. Thank you. Look, if I can just answer a couple of the questions, uh, not in any particular order, but uh, emergency management planning. Um, you and uh, the Chief spoke about the agencies working collaboratively. We're working with SES and MFB, and we've got some joint badge emergency management planning tools, you might say. The MFB on behalf of the sector have de developed an online emergency management manual and Caravan Parks, Vic SES have taken the lead in relation to that. So instead of the bad old days or whatever you want to call them where CFA had its and the MFB had its and SES and so on and so forth, we're looking at, at, at efficiencies. So just to answer that one, there was a question about what's the pledge? Um, and Jane will correct me if I'm wrong, but you know the pledge is, is an opportunity for us to work with our communities, so the community, so we can increase the un community's understanding of, of fire risk. Uh, and so that, uh, but also the, the community can pledge um, a fire safety activity, for instance check its smoke alarm or manage its vegetation or develop a plan or whatever, but also can nominate a brigade. And it's a bit of a competition because what the team's trying to work on with, with our region and district folk is looking at different ways of engaging with the community. And I know some people have said to us the pledge that's too Americanised, but at least people will you know, think pledge that actually means something rather than an oath or whatever it might be. And then last but not least, those maps there was a question about when will those maps be made available or something like that. We've, uh, we're working with our regions and our districts to say that uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, putting, um, we're putting those maps on uh, uh, brigades online and, um, um, and uh, um, we're asking our regions and districts to talk with their brigades uh, on how to best um, grab that information and utilise that information. So, thanks. And uh, Ben, did you have something you yeah, want to say about uh, them? I just wanted to uh, sort of refer to a couple of questions that have come up. So the first one about planning, which um, we've already been talking about, but EMV have been doing a lot of really good work over the last year and, and sort of developing a coordinated and solid approach to planning within the state. Um, and it's the same with sort of a, the community resilience framework as well. So um, both Lou Short and um, uh, Joe Buffoni. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> Sunday morning. Um, uh, they've been doing, you know, they're leading this, this project at the moment. So we've been engaging with them at the state level, and then we're going to start working down through regional and down to municipal and down to sort of community level. But we need to get a really coherent approach to it because we we all sort of go off with our own sort of siloed approach. All it ends up doing is, is confusing people. I guess the other thing I wanted to refer to as well is, is going into schools. And you know, there's no argument that kids are a really, really good way to get messaging out to, to a community and, and that sort of preparedness sort of stuff. They're the perfect little ambassadors to do it. Um, but if we all sort of go in and so, you know, um, the police go in with their ones and we go in with ours and CFA go in with theirs and MFB go in with theirs, teachers aren't going to have time to teach the kids how to read and write because it's, that's a lot of work. So we need to have a really, really coordinated approach to doing it. And I think that's something that, that possibly EMV could start um, sort of working on so we can get this really, really strong, coordinated approach to going into schools and do it do it as, you know, we're working as one rather than this sort of siloed approach. Because the, the messages that we are trying to get out to communities are essentially the same. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's that sort of getting ready, so, you know, how to prepare for an emergency um, and then knowing what to do. And one, one, I guess one of the other things, and it, I saw the one about um, triple zero versus one three two five hundred, and I've always been quite uh, interested. Being as you can tell, I'm not, not from around here, um, but uh, the, the the whole concept of fire and other emergencies, and it's like, well, hang on, we refer to fire as an emergency, and then we refer to you know SES does flood, storm, earthquake, tsunami, and those are emergencies as well. It's it's all one thing. We should be talking about an emergency, regardless of what it is. 
So um, this one two six, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <coughs> probably in Gwyn, if you want to jump in, because uh, this is uh, your baby as well. So uh, CFA and SES put some money in through the National Disaster Resilient Grant Scheme, and uh, just about to embark on a, a project uh, around putting the um, the actual key messages uh, within the uh, the curriculum and getting teachers to actually deliver it. Uh, through the schools, which is a really good way to get through to the kids. Gwen, do you want to say some more on that? Um, yeah, it, it's aimed at sort of the, the safety of the students presently as they are as, as students, but also this notion of generational change and we're creating an, uh, the next generation that is more uh, risk aware, uh, has a, a range of resilience resiliencies that will carry them forward so we don't have to um, the, the, the people coming up behind us don't have to beat their heads quite as hard against the brick wall as we do to get people to accept the risk and do something about the risk. So it's a sort of multifaceted. So we're working um, to produce uh, fantastic resources um, for the teachers to use and provide professional learning for the teachers to give them the confidence to deliver it. And our aim is that every young person in the state of Victoria will participate in um, a disaster resilience education at some point in their lives. So big aspirational goals, but I reckon we'll get there. I might take one on the floor. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot about short-term risks. Uh, I was just wondering when the SES and CFA are going to put out a definitive statement on the science of climate change that's got to be the greatest long-term risk and short-term risk that we're facing. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the 14th of July, we had a forum that was a um, uh, collaboration with uh, Emergency Management Victoria and the Emergency Services, where um, we put climate change on the agenda and we worked with leaders from, from the organisations um, and a number of people up here um, uh, attended that day. And we looked at... Um, you know, developing some principles for the sector to consider, as well as uh, short, medium and, and long-term actions. Uh, it's still in its formative phase, but you're absolutely right. Um, it's something that we need to grapple with. And I know Craig in his um, uh, strategic action plan, I think that's what the S stands for in SAP. Strategic action plan. Oh, thanks, Chief. Um, he's um, you know, put the teaser in there to say, we need to start thinking about the future and climate change. Because it, 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 one part is the emergency events, Yep. But we've got to start the journey sometime, and I suppose at least we're, we've started it. But, but part of it is the emergency events, but also part of it is the sustainability of, of our communities. And you know, we have a lot of people that work on the land. So what does it mean for Victoria's food bowl, but, but also uh, you know, emergency events in the future? So yes, maybe we've been a bit uh, slow, but, but we've started that journey now. Thanks. My name's Tim McNeely from the Golden Square Brigade. Uh, just recently we've had to, I guess is the right term, to elect a community safety officer in our brigade, which we traditionally didn't have. Um, and traditionally we've always left the community safety role up to our regional community safety team so that it was a consistent message coming from the state. Um, we're, we think we've got our finger on the pulse with community engagement, but we're struggling to really define what the community safety officer's role is the position description that comes with it is hugely broad and a lot of it's not relevant to us. So we're really after some guidance about what's the expectation of this person in our brigade. Are they um, expected to be taking on some of the role of the regional community safety team or is it more just about community engagement but it's termed community safety? Hi, very good question there. Um, part of it is, is uh, local needs for, you know, addressing local needs with, with local solutions. Um, yeah, we wanted it to be broad so that you can choose what's most appropriate in your, in your situation. We have brigades that are taking baby steps and brigades that are, you know, are, uh, capable of running the Olympic 100 metres, you know, so, so we've got brigades uh, across the whole gamut. So rather than being prescriptive and alienating a whole load of people, 
what we thought would be a bit more, you know, performance based as such, and, and enabling the, the partnership between our districts and the brigades to say, look, in your situation, your community needs, your level of development, this is what we, we recommend that you do. There's no right or wrong, you know. We don't do community engagement. Well, if you talk to your neighbour, you're doing community engagement, and then you've got other brigades that, that might do fire safe kids and so on and so forth. So rather than being prescriptive, and again, you know, we, we welcome your feedback. If you want more guidance and more prescription, because I know in our organisation, you know, SOPs and so, you know, we, we like that sort of stuff. So if we want a bit more prescription, then the message will be fed up and then we'll work, well, sorry, fed, fed up, I don't mean fed up, but, but fed up. Um, and, and we'll work with, with our regions and our districts and, and help provide, you know, guidance. Does that answer your question? Tim, I might just say, um, five years ago, there were 40 brigades represented at this forum. I think we've got 205 brigades. So in five years, we've actually multiplied by five number of brigades. The introduction of a role of um, community safety officer at brigade level is a way of CFA corporately saying, you know, traditionally we've had a captain, lieutenants, and an apparatus, and all that sort of stuff, of saying, this is a really important role. And we want every brigade to consider putting someone into that role. That's how important we see it. But it is a bit of an evolution. Um, and, and it's really good feedback. And perhaps we do need to give a bit more guidance, particularly when you're in an environment like Golden Square. Thank you. Uh, Kate, would, do you have anything you'd like to say about the KEF role, the similar, our equivalent? Uh, expectation, a similar kind of story for you, for SES? <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. So, uh, uh, SES now has a competency based course of volunteers, so the Community Education Facilitator course. It's a PUA. And, uh, we currently have a hundred, um, and many of you are in the room today around that. But it's really giving um, a really good grounding for you to actually go out and have the tools and the sources and sort of building capacity and capability and actually engaging with the communities. And on the back of that, we're actually then building what, you know, pick off the shelf or tools for your toolbox, some really uh, useful to, uh, resources for you use to go out and actually uh, engage with the community. So it's about what's the carrot and against what's the best bang for your buck and actually going for that. But it's really exciting for us at the moment to build this side of uh, the agency up um, and very working closely with CFA in making sure that we don't want to be going in on a Monday to the community and talking about fire and then turning up on a Tuesday and talking about flood and then on Wednesday going in and talking about uh, something completely different again. So there's a whole range of uh, behaviour change that's coming uh, in and it's a phased approach about how we do that to get more mature in the way that we conduct our business, but really exciting for us. Might take one on the floor, Gabby. Yes, hi, Dave Botherway from uh, Right Horse SES. You mentioned before there were some joint publications being prepared with uh, SES, CFA and MFP. However, it appears to me it should be a lot better integration, particularly for us metro units, uh, with the MFP, particularly now they've got heavy rescue functionality. Uh, could you like to update us on any further integration that's happening with MFB? Because otherwise they appear to be left out of this particular loop. I could hardly talk on behalf of the agent. <laughs> well, you do? Okay. Um, okay. So we are, uh, we are doing some... ...about and try and join up. There's been um, some projects under the auspice of Emergency Management Victoria, so the community-based emergency management project, so that's been running for the past 12 months. Uh, we looked at going into what we could term a vertical community, so high rises in Carlton. It's a really interesting concept because unlike most communities, you walk in the front door to a lift well, uh, and that's a concrete wall, and then you're going up the lift, and you really don't have that general sense of community. So some of the co-badging around that uh, is around that specific pilot project. Uh, we uh, are always uh, calling up WIM to say where can we actually uh, join up and do um, some work together. We've got some really great buy-in around our cold 
programs, so very much with MFB, Victoria Police and CFA on that. And we're getting some really great traction as well from um, Department of Health and Human Services and some of our other key partner agencies. So we are actually uh, doing this more and more often. We're getting a great buy-in. There is great buy-in at the stage. Um, I, I have heard from yesterday there are still some challenges on the ground to actually work together around that and we'll uh, support you um, in every way that we can to make sure that the messages are going up, down and across uh, to make sure that everybody is actually, uh, that we are all integrated and this is the way of the future. Um, and it's a, it's a really great initiative to get on board with. Just take one on the floor, Tracy. Hi, Nick Waldron, Emerald. Um, I just want to agree with one of the texts that came through. You and your, you're the man, okay? All right. Anyway, um, I'm the bloke who's going to bring up budgets. Uh, sorry, you. <laughs> um, I had a, a discussion with uh, DCO Haynes on the, who was on the um, stage yesterday regarding budgets, um, and, and I asked you, and this is directed at the SES as well, is that. We need tools and the um, equipment to do the com ed stuff we do. And I am just getting a little bit, I won't swear, annoyed, thank you, annoyed that all I hear is there's no budget, there's no budget, there's no budget. And I think uh, I'm just getting fed up with it. And I get dispirited, I get, um, you know, I just want to, ask both of you is to reconsider um, how the budgets are put together regarding ComEd and try and I'm, I'm going to give you a, an example of verbal message boards they are absolutely vital up in the Dandenong Ranges to get the messages out to the communities not only in Emerald but the whole of the Dandenong Ranges and I'm appealing to you and is to look at the budget and see if you know, the Dandenong the Range is one of the third, third uh, highest risk areas in the world. So we need to get those messages out and we can't do it. We're just handing out leaflets at uh, events and delivering stuff and all that. We, we need stuff to be put firmly in people's faces. That there's fire restrictions coming, uh, total fire ban day today, etc, etc. Um, I'd, I'd, and this goes to SES as well. I'm sure they have the same problem as well. So that's my question. And, uh, okay. so, so we'll do this uh, shared between Stephen and I so that uh, I'll make all the platitudes and no promises and then Stephen can pick up the rest. <laughs> I, I actually did uh, get some warning. Adam, Adam Barnett is in the audience somewhere. I saw him out in the car park and he said, oh, there's going to be a question about budget. So I said, oh, that's easy because... You know, I'll just tell them we work within the budget we've got. And he said, don't try that line because it's not going to work. <laughs> uh, but um, look, uh, I, I could go into a safety forum. Uh, I could walk onto any fire station. Uh, last night I had a passionate group who are asking for you know, new heavy tanker at Kongma. Um, uh, everywhere across our organisation, um, there are passionate people who are wanting... Um, more money to follow through with their particular um, project. And, and I guess it's, a, it's not an easy job sifting and sorting that. Uh, and, and government are you know, high on the list. Government come along and they'll fund certain projects and, and often they are big projects which take a lot of money which sometimes distract us. So I suppose my challenge back to you is to say yes we'll certainly take on board and every year we try and win extra resources. I mean, I, I see the role of people like Stephen and, and mine pretty simple. We create a bit of direction and a lot of the time that comes from you people. We win resources so that you can do what you've got to do and then we take the blame when it goes wrong. But uh, I, I guess a, a reflection, and I'm probably being a little bit unfair to, to my um, community safety people, I don't know that we've said what's the number one priority uh, of community education, community engagement activity that we absolutely have to fund. And if we've got this amount of money, 
you know, let's, let's rank them and order them to make sure that whatever funding we've got is going into the uh, most effective ways. Now, I know there are conversations and we do evaluation of our community safety program, but I'm, I'm just not sure we're as honed in as that. Um, I, I can't promise additional funding for the community education, community safety function. But what I can say, yesterday you would have seen Michael Wooden here, you would have seen Mark Thomas. Uh, we had um, Mark Sullivan, I don't know whether he's still here, he was banging the drums yesterday. Um, we, we had John Haynes here yesterday. Steve Warrington is, is winding up with a where to from here. Uh, and you've got me here today. So you've got a, a lot of, and, and obviously Andrew is here with Gwyn. You've got a lot of senior people who by their very presence and commitment are saying, we support you. If you're saying you need more money, that message is received and received loud and clear, and maybe we've got to do better. We'll try and do that. Stephen. Thanks, you. Um, from our point of view, obviously our budget is quite uh, a lot smaller than others in the emergency management field, but what we're doing is working very hard with the current government about a terms of reference to look at our funding. We're looking at the moment about our service review, so what services will be in, and obviously this education, resilience and, and working with our community is high on the agenda for us to move, to move into and do more of, and we're doing that within obviously budgets that are pretty restricted at the moment. But the terms of reference that we've put up to the government to look at a parliamentary review, which I think is all the, all the sounds are very good from government about saying we really need to look at how we resource the SES in the future, and we need to do that in a bipartisan in a bipartisan way because what tends to happen to us, as probably happens to a number of organisations, including the CFA, is you go into an election cycle and you get promises from one side and it doesn't get reflected if there's a change of government. So we need to get much better bipartisan support about what we need as a sector. So we're doing that at the moment. So I think that's a very positive for us um, and hopefully we'll see some announcements around that. But the other thing I think is exactly what we're doing in this room today is that as state government and federal governments are really struggling, as they'll tell us, to find revenue sources for all the things we want to do, and we see that debate around taxation, etc. we've got to come back with, well, how do we work much more efficiently with the resources that we've got in a combined way? And that's exactly what we're doing in these sorts of forums, is saying, well, the resource, scarce resources that we've got on, the, on our plate, how can we actually work together so that governments can see that they're getting great value from the money that they're putting out? I'm not saying that we don't need more, but at least I think we can put up our heads and say, well, of the resources that are out there, we're actually working very efficiently. And we've got some work to do, I know, and that. but I think that uh, we can put up our heads high and say in the emergency services sector, we're turning our mind to how can we look at those scarce resources and use them better. So there's a couple of, I think, positive things that are happening already, um, in the, in the, both in the SES, but the sector wide. Take one from the floor, Gabby. Uh, Chief, Don Alec from Wendaree. Um, there's been a couple of uh, text messages and I just want to talk a little bit about the fire services review that's just kind of come out of nowhere. I've got some deep concerns about integration and, and amalgamation, which everybody, we, we are as one, uh, except that I think that different groups have different ideas about what that means. My concerns are around the loss of integrated brigades, the loss of the title firefighter, uh, things that are mentioned in the terms of reference it's a great opportunity to talk to a large group of, especially, and I apologise to our SES colleagues, to the CFA volunteers about some of the implications of the fire service review. Uh, thanks, Don. And um, uh, for those who might not be aware, the government announced the review of the fire services. So, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting that it wasn't about the sector as such. Um, and, and without having the terms of reference in front of me, there are some important common words there. What one of the uh, uh, terms of reference dealt with the resourcing of the fire services. So it might go to the previous question that uh, maybe this is an opportunity to say, you know, in some areas we're not properly resourced. It also very much went to the um, uh, question about interoperability. Um, and, and look, I guess I'd put it in the context that we are on a journey, and if one looks at um, the uh, a lot of ministerial statements, uh, it talks about reform within the emergency management sector. And there's been some huge changes, even in the last five years, 
since 2009, not only about how the emergency services work, but also how we work with the broader emergency management sector. In terms of you know, one fire service or one fire and emergency service, uh, I think one doesn't need to go any further than the statement by Emergency Services Minister Jane Garrett on Thursday when the review was announced, and on Friday I think she spoke on John Fame, and she was very firm in saying that this is not about one fire service. However, we need to recognise that uh, these reviews often will be uh, a bit dispassionate, independent, and they may, may point to things that we can do to make us more effective and more efficient with MFB. So my view with the uh, fire services review is to welcome it, and if it points to ways in which we can become uh, more efficient and more effective, then that's a good thing. I, I also harp back to the Victorian Bushfires uh, Royal Commission where the topic of a single fire service was debated long and hard, and the evidence is still on the Victorian Bushfire Commission Royal, Royal Commission report. And there was some very strong evidence given uh, by a number of uh, emergency management consultants and experts in change that said, just because you've got fire common as the middle word in your organisational name, doesn't mean you should be one organisation that you need to consider the culture um, and, and the people within the organisation. I think this goes to the heart of what you were saying, Don. So, um, you know, the, the um, if Craig Lapsu was here, you know, this, this, this um, terminology we've got about working as one, um, you know that it's working as one, not working as one team. So I think there's a, there's a bit, it's a bit subtle here and I think we recognise that each agency, be it Red Cross or SES or Victoria Police or CFA, has developed with a long history and, and a culture, which each agency is really proud of its culture, and you can't change that overnight, and you need to respect that, because if you don't, you'll end up losing the people, particularly the, the volunteers. So I'd suggest that the journey we're going down, Don, is one where we continue to work more closely with e each other. Example in front of us today with SES and, and um, CFA. But we need to challenge ourselves to, to do that even better. Will we be changing the one fire service? Don't know. That will be a political decision. But the Minister signalled quite strongly on Friday that that's not what's on the agenda. It's about the effic efficiency, effectiveness and the funding of the fire services. Now, I probably haven't spent as much time analysing the terms of reference as I should have, but um, I hope that somehow gives my position on it um, and reflects what I've heard the Minister saying about it, Tom. We've got time for one more question. So we'll go to Tracy. It's not on. Yes, it is on. Um, yeah, uh, Bruce George on West Fire Brigade. Um, just, you talked about budgets, and I was just wondering whether there's an opportunity to, um, in terms of economies of scale, to build community safety training programs that are across the sector. So rather than the CFA building a training program to train its volunteers on how to deliver community safety, and the SES doing the same thing with a community facilitation course, whether in fact we could save some money by actually working together to deliver one community safety training package that could be then trained across both sectors. And that just not, not just works for community safety, but also, for, and I think I picked up before, hang on, I'll wait. Um, <coughs> also extends through to primary schools as well. Like I picked up, I think, if I heard correctly, it was Ben was saying that there is going to be some work done around building a training program to deliver to primary schools across agencies. Is that correct? Yeah. So the question was, sorry, in terms of can we get economies of scales by working together to deliver one training program to train our volunteers to deliver community safety messaging? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think on the, on the first instance, it's... Um, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> 
Um, I think in the first instance we have to we have to agree what our messaging is, and that's part of what you know what we're doing with E and B as well. Is, um, you know, again, it's 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 Craig Batchley says E and B is not an organisation; it's the way we're going to do emergency management, and it's emergency management for Victoria. And I think you know, and and, and let's face it, E and B has only been around for, for a year. They're doing some really good work, and it's going to take a little bit longer for what they've been working on to really hit that rubber to hit the road. So. Um, it's certainly on the radar, and, and it's you know it's getting the ping's getting faster and faster if you like. So, um, but I think that's the way to go. You know, it, um, I, was, I was thinking about it earlier that um, I mean there's all sorts of the questions that have come up on screen, and I sit there thinking of an answer, and by that stage it's just moved on. But um, but there, there's a lot of lot of great work that's being done. And, and, and a lot of work in that, in that consolidated space, you know, I mean, so there was one thing about uh, emergency management throughout Australia, and um, I mean, at SES we've been working on this, this revision of our strategic communications approach, you know, our messaging and going out to communities. We've actually talked to the other SESs around the country, and they've all gone, yeah, we're in. And so if we actually get this through, it could be the first example of a nationwide campaign for SES, which would just be a magic one. Yeah. And Absolutely, yeah. But just to build on that, at the national level, at AFAC, we've got a community safety group, and all the agencies work together to look at, um, because 80% of what we do is the same, it's just the context has changed, whether it's fire, whether it's flood, whether it's earthquake, whether it's whatever it might be. So at a national level, AFAC's been providing a lot of leadership, and I know that, you know, um, SES are there, CFA are there, so on and so forth. Um, so that we get consistency and we also look at economies of scale. It'll take time. 20 years ago, it was, no, you can only talk about one message. Now it's, you have one opportunity to talk to the community, so talk to them about safety. You know, and I suppose the next, the next step for us is, it might not be us talking to the community, it might be another group. So how do we empower that other group so they can pass their message when they're talking about food or when they're talking about whatever it might be? Sorry guys, we will have to wrap it up. We have gone a bit over time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, we will have to move on. Um, someone has asked a question, can we get a copy of all the um, comments that have come up? So we've said yes, that's, that's going to happen. Um, so hooray. I think we should... from our management team is something that will come across and I think that's what these guys have displayed so well done. Alright, um, so now we've got uh, a longer breakout before morning tea so start thinking about where you're going to head. Uh, please be mindful the mobile education unit is outside on the bus to my left uh, in 30 people only so first